Hello, and welcome to Cool Creative Communications, Dazzling Data Visualization. My name is Kiri Burkett, and I'm the Data and Evaluation Coordinator for the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, Southeastern Atlantic Region. This course is intended to be a quick start guide to creating visualizations. There are so many visualization tools, tutorials, guides, books, and blogs out there to help you explore data visualization. Here, I've curated some of that information and hope that through this course, together, we can start thinking more critically about how best to communicate data visually. On the technical side of things, we'll get acquainted with Tableau Public, one of the most popular visualization tools. That said, here are our objectives for this course. To use National Library of Medicine resources to locate data sets, to develop data visualizations using Tableau Public, to critique peer data visualizations using an evaluation model. But in this first module, more specifically, I'm going to discuss a few foundational concepts and hopefully get everyone inspired to start experimenting with visualization. So now, without getting too theoretical, the why and how of data viz. Why do we visualize data? Visualization enables viewers to quickly glean insights from data. Data is everywhere. Structured data is much more rare, and it takes a lot of work to capture and structure data and tease out the objects and the attributes and the relationships between them. The table on the left is from census.gov. It shows the percentage of the male population and female population at every age in the year 2017. In a sense, a table like this one is already a graphical representation of data relationships. It's organized so that we can find what we need to answer questions. But it would still take a while to scroll through different years and different ages to find the figure you're looking for and it would take some time to compare the values and determine trends. On the right, in the graphic, we can quickly see how the population is distributed by sex and age. And on the original site, census.gov, the graphic is animated so we can watch that distribution shift over time in a matter of seconds. The human system of perception and cognition is constantly, subconsciously looking for patterns, which is why visualization can be so useful. Math, statistics, and information science give us the tools to organize and analyze data, but visualization enables us to communicate its key aspects more intuitively, persuasively, and memorably. Let's look at a few examples. Data visualization helps us find patterns. Here's a famous visualization you may have seen before. In 1854, a cholera epidemic swept London. Physician John Snow plotted the locations of cholera deaths on a map along with the locations of water pumps. It's a little hard to see, but the pumps are represented with X's and the deaths are dots. He noticed that many of the deaths were clustered around a specific water pump and he is credited with the discovery that cholera is transmitted through contaminated water. I had seen this example a few times, first when I was an environmental educator and I was being trained to facilitate a curriculum about water, and again in the data visualization course I took as part of my MLIS. I didn't learn until doing the research to track it down again for this presentation that John Snow's data collection methods were kind of sketchy and this case study, although it turned out to be true, would definitely not be considered to be conclusive. That's a good reminder that data visualization is certainly useful in developing hypotheses, but shouldn't be relied upon to develop conclusions. This visualization is a good jumping off point for a carefully designed study. Visualizations can help us make decisions. This is a screenshot of the Name Voyager tool on babynamewizard.com. You can type in names and see these popularity graphs for each one based on data from the Social Security Administration. If you have small children or if you're just nerdy about naming trends like I am, you've perhaps noticed that Emma has been a very popular name in the last few years. 
When I looked at this graph, I thought that this big generational gap was really interesting. Maybe people are naming their daughters after great-grandparents? I also noticed this little blip in the 2010s of new names or other names that start with the same letters as Emma. This could be an example of using data visualization to inform a very personal decision. Visualizations can also help us communicate ideas. This is one graphic from a series by the Wall Street Journal in 2015 about the prevalence of preventable diseases. I think this is a neat example in that the designers managed to show pretty clearly the granular year-by-year, state-by-state data, as well as the broad sweeping trend. We can see on this chart the profound and undeniable effect of the measles vaccine on public health all across the United States. Although, unfortunately, I think we may need an updated version to reflect these last six years. Visualizations can also help us to persuade, to inspire, and to advocate. This is another classic visualization developed by Florence Nightingale to convey how many soldiers' lives were lost to preventable diseases caused by sanitation issues in hospitals during the Crimean War. This chart design is known as the Cox comb. Because it's hard to read, but necessary in order to understand the visualization, I'm going to read the description. It says, the areas of blue, red, and black wedges are each measured from the center as a common vertex. The blue wedges measured from the center of the circle represent the area for the deaths from preventable or mitigatable zymotic diseases. The red wedges measured from the center, the deaths from wounds, and the black wedges measured from the center, the deaths from all other causes. She then goes on to explain the few months where wedges coincide. For example, the black wedge and the red wedge in October 1854. Florence Nightingale is credited with professionalizing nursing as well as pioneering the field of biostatistics. How do we visualize data? Data visualization is essentially the practice of attaching visual, visual attributes to data points. When we think about how best to represent this data, we need to think about the type of data that we're working with. Data is broken down into three broad categories. The first is nominal data. This is the labels that we attach to things, or the way that we categorize things. They can be as broad as the names of continents or as specific as the names of individual people. Nominal data can be compared with an equal to or not equal to relationship. Either the points are the same or they're different. So we can think of nominal data as being words and names. Next is ordinal data. These are data points that can be put in a meaningful order, months of the year or gold, silver, and bronze awards. Ordinal data points can be compared with a greater than or less than relationship. And finally, quantitative data, what we probably think of when we think of data. Quantitative data consists of numbers or values that can be plotted on an X or Y axis. It can support arithmetic operations. We represent the data points with visual marks on the page or screen. And we vary these marks in different ways to represent the relationships between data. On this slide are the cartographer Jacques Bertin's seven original visual variables. Bertin was a French cartographer who, with his publication of Semiologie Graphique in 1967, was among the first people to provide a theoretical foundation to data visualization. If you study visualization further, you may see other visual variables referenced, but a lot of visualizations boil down to these seven. Position, or changes in location, as on an X or Y axis. Size, like the length of bars on a bar graph or the size of wedges in a pie chart. Color hue and color value, as you're likely to see on maps. Orientation, or slope and then, I think less frequently, shape and texture. 
We saw an example of shape being used in the water pump and cholera deaths map where the pumps were X's and the deaths were dots. Shape and texture may be used when color isn't an option or when you're trying to represent several variables at once. Let's take a look at a quick example. Take a moment to look at this sequence of numbers. How many threes are there? How about now? I've manipulated a few visual characteristics, the line weight of the threes and the color of all the other numbers, and we can instantly see that there are four threes. We can analyze this image pre-attentively, or without the need for attention, and in milliseconds. When we're designing information visualizations, we leverage the principles of human perception to instantly infuse meaning into data. Visualizing data is so effective because we as humans are always looking for patterns, form, and structure. This is the idea of vision optimization. A simple example of this is when I look at my friend, I don't just see their hair, their nose, and their eyes. I instantly put that together and I see their face and recognize them. Here's another probably familiar example of vision optimization. This is an image of 38 blue shapes, mostly polygons. Our brains, however, group them and organize them, and we read this basically instantly as the letters IBM. Okay, so this is going to be an ironically crowded slide, but I like this illustration a lot. It's actually only part of an illustration by Christina Zarave. And she has an entire series of sketches about user experience design processes and principles. Any of you who have studied design or human-computer interaction or maybe psychology may have discussed the Gestalt principles before. The Gestalt principles are a set of rules for human perception. Of these principles, I think the ones that are most relevant to data visualization are simplicity, proximity, and similarity. Let's look at a few examples. The rule of simplicity is the basis for the rest of the rules. It's the idea that humans have a limited capacity for processing input. Like with the IBM logo, our mind is always searching for the simplest way to interpret what we see. Our threes give us a different kind of example. On the left, there are four threes, and we can see that right away, pre-attentively. But on the right, there are 12 threes, and discerning that is a slower process. We need to kind of go through the numbers sequentially and consciously count them, or at least I do. The principle of proximity is the idea that objects that are closer to each other are perceived as being more related than the ones that are not positioned near them. Here, rather than just seeing 20 circles, we tend to see two groups, a group of four and a group of 16. An example of this in the wild might be buttons on a website navigation menu. They should all be together, usually either along the top of the website or kind of stacked down the left-hand side, because they all have the same function. Here's a website that I'm very familiar with. Uh, this is the library where I worked during graduate school. And it has both, a top navigation menu for moving around the university library site, and then a side menu for navigating just within the STEM library page. And of course, the principle of similarity says that if two objects have similar characteristics, we perceive these objects to be more related than the ones that don't share these characteristics. So again here, we see two groups of circles, a blue group and an orange group. Back to our threes, here we don't have the principle of proximity. Our threes are all spread out, but there's a dark black group and a light gray group, and they're quickly and easily separated and associated together. Here's an example of a visualization that makes meaningful use of proximity and similarity and uses hue and position to show the relationships within the data. 
we have colored dots of the same size and shape, each representing a member of parliament. They're grouped by color, which represents political party, and by proximity, which represents voting behavior. They're also positioned on the page based on how they voted. Closer to the top right corner indicates voting closer to the Tory establishment. Closer to the bottom right indicates voting closer to the Tory rebels. I don't know much about British politics, but I can quickly see that there are about 10 small clusters of blue dots and two large main clusters of red dots. The whole graphic is kind of fan-shaped, with the dots more distributed top to bottom on the Tory side and more concentrated in the middle on the Labour side. And that's confirmed by the title and subtitle, Myriad Divisions Among the Tories, and Theresa May Struggles to Hold Together Her Fractious Party. The designers selectively labeled only a handful of dots with MPs' names, highlighting some specific pieces of information, but not overwhelming us with all of it. So all of these principles manifest in a handful of common, familiar types of charts. As you develop your goals for your visualization, you need to think about what types or what aspects of the data set you want to highlight. Then you'll need to choose what type of visualization best emphasizes those aspects. Now there are plenty of people who have put a lot of thought and research into choosing charts. And here's one guide that I liked in particular by Stephanie Evergreen. A few of these suggestions are more infographic than data visualization, but the Chart Chooser 3.0 is still a really useful guide to different types of visualizations organized by goal. When it comes to applying these principles to your own visualizations, here are some quick practical tips. Be mindful of the cultural and symbolic connotations of color. For example, we tend to associate red with hot or with danger, green with the environment, and blue with cold or water. If we're showing concentration, like on a map, it feels intuitive to show higher concentration with more saturated colors and vice versa. The next I called get it right and black and white. Be inclusive of people who don't perceive color like you do. This is a big topic that I've tried to condense into one small bullet point, but there are resources online to help you choose accessible color palettes, and I'll include them on a separate resources page for this module. Next is stick to about six or fewer different colors. We'll take a look at a problematic example of that that reinforces that idea in another minute. And finally, follow familiar patterns and structure. And this just means that there are certain things that we expect when we're looking at a document. We read from left to right and from top to bottom. So your visualization should make sense in that direction. We're used to north being at the top of the page and south being at the bottom of the page. We tend to expect the biggest things to be the most important and for ideas to be expressed from the most general to the most specific. Now we'll get a little bit of practice in critiquing visualizations and a demonstration of why a little bit of thought of design principles can go a long way towards making visualizations more effective. So take a look at this visualization for a moment. In my opinion, the colors on this map are misleading. The shifts between the hues look abrupt, and my eye is drawn to the dark blue uh, areas on the map for no real reason. 0% and 100% identifying as white would look more similar than 0% and 50% based on this color scheme. And in a way, it defies conventional color associations with red being the 0% concentration. We could fix some of these issues by choosing a monochromatic palette. Colorbrewer2.org is a tool that you can use to choose color schemes for cartography or for map visualizations. Here's another one.
the colors don't add any new information to the visualization. We're only looking at two variables here, the name of the state, which is labeled, and the population growth, which is shown in the length of the bars. The chosen colors are also very saturated, which can be kind of hard to look at. To avoid hurting people's eyes or implying anything unintentionally with color, it would be better to choose one less saturated color for all of the bars. And our last one. There are just too many different colors. It's almost impossible to go back and forth between the key and the chart to figure out which state is which. We could instead stick with about six colors to color code the dots by region of the U.S. rather than by individual state. Then we could label a few specifically selected dots on the map with their state name to draw attention to outliers or interesting cases. This week you'll explore some more data visualization on blogs and websites. Your assignment will be to add to our course data visualization Hall of Fame or Hall of Shame by posting a link to a visualization that caught your eye as being particularly good or particularly problematic in our discussion board. You'll describe the data relationship that is being represented, what techniques the creator used to express that relationship, and why you think those techniques were either effective or ineffective. Now, a Hall of Shame visualization doesn't need to be totally ineffective. It could just be one feature that you noticed that you think the creator overlooked, or one decision that you think they should have made differently. I've included a document in this module with a list of resources for finding visualizations for this activity. So this document's on Moodle uh, with some supplemental resources that accompany the module. There you'll find a list of visualization blogs and galleries that will help you complete the assignment. You're certainly welcome to use other sites or visualizations, but if you're looking for a starting point, you can start there. I've also linked a few tools for choosing accessible colors and two documents that discuss Section 508 Web Accessibility Compliance in the context of data visualization. Finally, I've suggested two optional resources. The first is a TED Talk by Hans Rosling, who is a professor of global health and the founder of Gapminder.org. In a passionate and enthusiastic presentation, he uses data visualization to debunk myths about the developing world. The talk is older, from 2006, but it's still an inspiring video. The second is 39 Studies of Human Perception in 30 Minutes by Kennedy Elliott, the graphics editor at the Washington Post. I recommend it if you're interested in how human perception influences design and you'd like an overview of some of the scholarly foundations of this discipline. Thank you for joining me for the Module 1 video. Please don't hesitate to contact me with any questions or comments. I look forward to seeing you on the discussion board.